ready when you are. All right, everybody, thank you for being here uh, tonight. We're going to be talking about the cerebellum. We're going to be making basic, uh, we're going to be talking basically uh, just the this, this simple stuff about what you have to know uh, to be a functional neurologist or, or to play at this game of functional neurology. I'm not saying that you have to be a functional neurologist. I train doctors all over the world that have a basic understanding of neurology and we just take them through step by step by step and just every one of these seminars are designed just to move the needle just a little bit make you a better clinician and and know the and to understand the why of what you're doing and I find that the, the biggest mistake uh, with doctors they can tell you what they're doing but then you ask them why they're doing it they're kind of like uh, uh, I don't know and and our slogan and uh, Bartle Brain and Body is we know what we're doing and we know why we're doing it. So if you want to know why you're uh, looking at the cerebellum, you're in the in the perfect place. So we're going to break this down into three different modules. Okay, and so this would be module number one. So let's let's start with the basic concept of what what we have over the cerebellum. So the cerebellum actually has uh, three lobes. Uh, one is the flocular nodular lobe. And when it comes to neurology, if you don't already know, uh, it's nothing can just have one name. It's like almost like a, a neurological law because that would make everything too easy. OK, so like each lobe of the cerebellum, uh, there's three lobes and there's actually three names to each lobe. So how fun is that? So we got the flocular nodular lobe. This is called the vestibulocerebellum. And the reason it's called the vestibulocerebellum is because the vestibular nucleus, which we're going to talk about, here in just a minute is presynaptic to the flocular nodular lobe. So you got the flocular nodular lobe, the cerebellum, and the archaeocerebellum. This is the oldest part of the cerebellum. In fish, this is called the lateral swim line. So uh, what do fish do? They, they have eyes and they have a spine. And of course, they've got the little fins, but uh, we, have, we have arms and we actually have a part of our brain that fish doesn't have or a cerebellum uh, that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. But, but fish, you know, deal with uh, spine and eyes. You know, so guess what this is? Flocket nodular, spine and eyes. It controls your, your spinal tone and it controls your eye movements. Okay. Now, the next uh, aspect of the cerebellum, we have what is called the vermal region. And then we have the paravermal vermal, or beside the vermis. Okay. Now, this paravermal region, uh, this is actually called not just the vermis and the paravermis, but this is called the spinocerebellum. Why is it called the spinocerebellum? Uh, when we get into next week's module in depth, you'll find out that. Um, in the spinal cord, all right, we have what is called the accessory cuneate nucleus, okay, and then over here in this, in this, uh, what is called the, uh, uh, excuse me, just a second, this uh, little part over here is called um, Clark's nucleus, the intermedial medial uh, cell nucleus. Now, here's what's important: that uh, accessory cuneate nucleus is above the Clark's nucleus. So what happens here is everything that's T1 and above fire muscle spindles fire through this accessory cuneate nucleus and it fired in, into the vermis and the paravermis. Now also the uh, Clark's nucleus down here, all of your muscle spindles and go to tendon organs from your lower extremities T2 and below, they actually fire through Clark's nucleus and if they're in the spine they're going to fire through the vermis and if they're in the limbs they're going to fire to the paraburma. So let me back up. Accessory cuneate nucleus is going to take muscle spindles and go to tendon organ to T1 and above. If it's in the cervical spine, look at this, look at the architecture, look at the simplicity of this. The vermis is midline. <clears throat> so everything from in the cervical spine that fires to the accessory cuneate nucleus is going to go midline. Your shoulders, elbows, and hands are going to fire into this paraburmal region. Now in the accessory, uh, I'm sorry, in the Clark's nucleus down here, T2 and below, if it's in the spine, thoracic spine or lumbar, it's going to fire into the vermal region. And if it's hips, knees, or feet, it's going to fire into the paravermal region. And then the last part of the cerebellum is called the dentate nucleus or the posterior, posterior cerebellum over here. And then we have the dentate nucleus. Now the dentate nucleus 
this posterior lobe is called well, the posterior lobe, and then it's also called the arc of the uh, neocerebellum, the newest part of the cerebellum, and then also the cerebrocerebellum. So that what happens is the right brain to program movement or to say, I want to, I want to grab the cell phone. You know, you're, you have to decide to move it, your prefrontal cortex, and then your prefrontal cortex, what it's going to do is fire down to the contralateral cerebellum into the posterior lobe. That's why this is called the neocortex, because the neocortex, the newest part of your brain, fires to the neocerebellum, the newest part of the cerebellum. So you see the beautiful architect there. Now, here's how the three lobes work. We have the posterior lateral, uh, I'm sorry, the primary fissure, primary fissure through here that separates the uh, uh, the flocular nodular lobe from the rest of the cerebellum. And then we have the primary fissure and what the primary fissure does, it separates the anterior lobe, which is up here, from the posterior lobe here. So we have the flocculonodular lobe. This is the flocculus in the center of the nodular. So flocular nodular lobe, it has another name called the vestibulo cerebellum because the vestibular nucleus is presynaptic to the flocular nodular lobe. It's the archaeocerebellum. So there's your three names, flocular nodular lobe, vestibular cerebellum and archaeo cerebellum. Now this, uh, the anterior lobe, aka paleo cerebellum, aka spino cerebellum, because the spinal cord is presynaptic to these areas. See how that works? So, and then the, then the posterior lobe, we have our dentate nucleus, which is the neo cerebellum. So, and it's so the neo cerebellum, posterior lobe, and then we have the, uh, Cerebrum, the neocortex of the cerebrum fire to the cerebra, the neocortex of the cerebellum or the dentate nucleus. So those are the big, big pictures there that we need to know about what's the, you know, looking at it from 30,000 feet, what what does what are these lobes here? All right. I've already drawn this out for you. <clears throat> so let's just go through this. All right. So the way this works, we can actually test this system in a neurological exam through eye movements and actually posture. So how does this work? So we have to know what is presynaptic here to this flocular nodular lobe. And we have these hair cells that's in our inner ear. And it's called, and they're actually anchored to what is called our petreous portion of our temporal lobe. Okay, it's just a bone. The hair cells are anchored in there. Don't forget that these hair cells are in a tube. It's called the endolymph. In the, in the, uh, the otolith system, and inside the otolith system, we have endolymph, okay, in, in, in this uh, tube. So we have this endolymph. This is anchored to the putrid portion of our temporal lobe. So when we actually turn our head, these hair cells in here, they get uh, refracted. Now, these short, the short hair cells, these are called uh, stereocilia. This is all academics right here. And then the big hair cell is called the kinocilium. So the way this works, if you realize that this, that this, that this portion of the hair cell, these receptors are actually anchored to a bone. That's important to understand. So that whenever we move our head one way or another in this angular position, okay, then these hair, hair cells get refracted or deflected, and then it's gonna depolarize the system. So when we move our head, okay, then this the endolymph, the fluid in the inner inner ear, is going to uh, flow across here, and it's going to bend the stereocilia toward the kinocilia, and this is, this system is going to depolarize and become activated. So this receptor, this is the way it works in all of neurology. The receptor is going to fire to a ganglion. Now, the ganglion, when you hear the term ganglion, except for, here's the trick, there's always an exception in neurology, except for the basal ganglion, okay, so by the name of a ganglion, if I can say this in English, ganglion means that it's actually a, a group of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. The problem is the basal ganglion was named and it's inside the brain, so go figure that one out. All right, so... Uh, start with ganglion. When you hear the term ganglion, it's in the peripheral nervous system with the one exception that I told you, the basal ganglion. And this, uh, this scarpous ganglion is a group of cell bodies. That's what a ganglion is. And then this is going to fire 
to the vestibular nucleus. So see how we just changed gears there. This is all peripheral. And now when we said the word nucleus or nuclei, now we're talking about a group of cell bodies that's now in our central nervous system. And please understand, I'm not gonna keep beating this dead horse, but with the exception of the basal ganglion. Okay, <clears throat> so we've got in this vestibular ganglion here, we've got four subnuclei. Just so you know where we are, where, where home, home plate is here, is this is actually in the pontomedullary uh, uh, area. Uh, so it, this is where, our, where we're located right here. So this vestibular system is presynaptic to our flocular nodular lobe. So the way the system works in every lobe of the cerebellum, there are some rules that we can go by. There's a 40 to one rule in every lobe of the cerebellum. It means that whenever this sensory input comes in, something has to process it. So 40 bits of information comes in, it gets processed, and then we're, we're gonna have one bit of information that goes out, okay? So the, and, and there's some rules that if we abide by this, we, it'll make life a whole lot easier. The cortex of the cerebellum, this is our processor. I'm running out of room here. Uh, this is the processor, and this processor takes this sensory information, processes it, and then it's going to be have a output uh, deep cerebellar nucleus. So when this system gets processed, now again, this is in every lobe of the cerebellum, we have, and I've made just as simple as I can, MPG. All right, and this MPG, just think of it, this is your acronym, would be miles per gallon. But of course, it's not called that, but this is just a simple um, a way of remembering the molecular cell, Purkinje cell, and granular cell layer. These are your processing systems in every lobe of your cerebellum. So in this uh, blocker nodular lobe, we have our processor, the MPG. And I don't need, mean to get into too, too much of academia here because it starts to bore people to death. But just all of this information gets processed, and then there's an axon that comes out from our Purkinje cell. And what this Purkinje cell does is it fires to the deep cerebellar nucleus. Okay, so this processor, the Purkinje cell, is going to fire to the deep cerebellar nucleus. No matter what level of the brain we're in, this is consistent throughout. Sensory information comes in; it gets processed by the molecular cell. Uh, Purkinje cell, granular cell, and the granular cell is going to send this arm out <clears throat> to this deep cerebellar nucleus. And what's important about this is this is an inhibitory system. Okay, so the deep cerebellar nucleus actually inhibits the, let me back up, the Purkinje cell actually inhibits the deep cerebellar nucleus. Why is this important? Because everything else that comes into this deep cerebellar nucleus actually excites it. Okay, so all the sensory input that comes in, remember, we're just keeping it simple tonight, excites this pathway, but these Purkinje cells come in and they pump the brake. So you'll find out in neurology, uh, in health, there has to be homeostasis. So if you got a gas pedal, you got to have a brake pedal. Because if you just have a gas pedal, if you have an automobile that's or you don't have a brake pedal, you don't have a you have a you have a very dangerous situation. So a car's got a, a gas pedal and a brake pedal. So it's the same way in neurology. Everything that fires into this system excites it, except for the Purkinje cell, which inhibits it. And what's important here, this is why we run Cyrex array number five to see if we have any autoimmune disorder toward the cerebellum or GABA. Here's why. I'm sorry, or GAD. I, I, I was wrong there. Uh, this is the uh, this neurotransmitter is GABA. But what happens is you have glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, and you need GAD. Uh, which is glutamic uh, acid decarboxylase is an enzyme, and it reduces glutamate into GABA, which is an inhibitory, neuro, uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter. I'll get to that in just a second. <clears throat> now, the problem with this is you can have an autoimmune disorder to, to your cerebellum, or you can have an autoimmune disorder to GAD, which means that this brake pedal no longer works. That's important because because see, when this system fails, the system that the, the problem with this with people, they get vertigo, they get dizziness, uh, they get nausea. Uh, when they get in a car, uh, they, they have to be the driver. They can't uh, be a passenger. 
when they read, they can get nauseated. And we're going to see why here in just a second, because this actually controls and coordinates your eye movements. Now, another interesting point here with every lobe of your cerebellum, and this is really a gold nugget right here, but every lobe of your cerebellum is presynaptic to your autonomic nervous system. Okay, so how goes your autonomic nervous system is one of the aspects of that is how well is your cerebellum uh, functioning. So hair cells fired the carpet ganglion to the vestibular nucleus, fired into the follicular nodule lobe. The follicular nodule lobe is going to process this. It's going to send an output nucleus. And from here, from the superior and middle vestibular nucleus, this is going to give us our eye movements. This is called the vestibular ocular reflex. So in health, in health, your eyes should go in the opposite direction of your head. So if I do this movement right here and I tell a patient to stick their thumb out, turn their head right and left, uh, just like a lady that came in, she'd got uh, uh, mid stages of dementia. And so what's happened is I have them follow my finger and she's doing this. She can't keep up with my finger. And then whatever I'm doing, she's doing uh, our uh, times one. This is what it's called in neurology, just moving one body part with fixation. And when she rotates to the right, what happens is her eyes keep coming off the target. And within just a matter of doing this about 10 times, she's actually able to fixate on her thumb. And see, this is what I told her daughter and her husband. I'm like, that's neuroplasticity right there. Your brain is actually learning how to create new axons to actually solve this problem. And so the flocular nodule, the flocular nodule globe fires into the vestibular nucleus. This is called the vestibular ocular reflex. Our eyes go in the opposite direction of your head. The reason this is important is because when you have children who have ADD, ADHD, or autism, what, what people that don't understand functional neurology, they put people on a protocol and they put them in a reading rehab. They put them in a reading rehab and try to get them to read. And this part of their, their, their cerebellum, the archaeocerebellum, the oldest part of the cerebellum, can't even properly do eye pursuits. So if I take my finger and I go across this field and you can't follow that, how well do you think a child is going to be able to, to pursue across a page and actually see each word and make sense of it when their eyes are doing like this, when we're doing a pursuit mechanism, something that simple. Now, also this medial, this is important, this medial and lateral vestibular nucleus does something special. The medial and lateral vestibular nucleus, ipsilateral, maintains postural tone of your pair of spinal muscles. So, so with this, and remember what I said when you, we first came on, the flocular nodular lobe in fish that's called the lateral swim line. And then what does the lateral swim line control in fish? Uh, spine and eyes. So we've got our flocular nodular lobe here, and guess what it does in human beings? Spine and eyes. But thank goodness God made us a tad bit better than fish, and we're a tad bit more complicated complicated than fish so because we have dexterity in our shoulders, our lower extremities, and actually in our fingers. Okay, so the way that we're going to look at this too, and I've got to wrap this up and I got about two minutes and 41 seconds. So the way we're going to test this, again, we look at postural tone, and if we have hypotonia, just think about the, the abnormal flex posture. Uh, but it, with our eyes, and we're going to be looking at the patient here. And he's happy to see you because he's in the clinic. He, he, he needs to figure out how are you going to be able to fix him. So these eye movements for our right cerebellum are going to be up to the right, down to the left, and to the left. And you know what? That's confusing as all get out for most people. And then we're going to go to the left. But see, when you understand this and you understand that the neurology starts with the archaeocerebellum, then moves to the posterior lobe, and then moves to the cerebellum. Then we actually start to rehab patients from the oldest to the newest. Okay, this is the foundation of our, our, our neuraxis right here. So, all right, so I'm the patient. This up and to the right, and we have the we have a canal system. We have the anterior canal, we have the posterior canal, and we have horizontal canal. So let's keep this simple. If I go to my left here, if I pursue to the left, what I'm actually activating is my right horizontal canal. So if I if I were to ask you to stick your finger out, now you're looking at me, so it's going to look right the opposite because I'm the patient. And we look at our thumb, and if I turn my head to the right, 
my eyes go to the left. But see, the way we test this with a patient, just say, follow my finger. And they should be able to follow that. And if they come off the target, that means that the right horizontal canal needs stimulation. So how do you stimulate the right horizontal canal? You say, fixate on your thumb and turn your head to the right. Now, if we want to test the uh, left horizontal canal, we have to follow the finger to the right. The head, the eyes go in the opposite direction of the head. We're going to shut down in about one minute. This is pre-programmed, all right, to shut down at 30 minutes. So we look to the right, and then how do I know this is our right horizontal canal? If we turn, if we fixate on an object and turn our head to the left, our eyes reflexogenically go to the right. So we have a, a anterior canal, posterior canal. If I say up and to the right, what I'm doing is I'm actually activating my right anterior canal. I'll cover this a little bit more uh, next week, but if I actually fixate on my thumb and I dump water out of my ear and I fixate on that, what I'm doing is I'm activating my right anterior canal. And this is how we test that. If I go down into the left, I'm activating my left posterior canal. If I dump water out of my right ear, like I'm fixating, boom. I dump water.